Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would respond to a bunch of patron emails. So let's do that today. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I am a professor and a therapist. This first email is from patron Erica. She writes, Hi, Kirk. I was wondering if you might consider discussing the risks of misdiagnosing borderline personality disorder with bipolar disorder. I know you are not keen on using these labels in therapy, but in some cases, people come to therapy with these diagnoses. I was also wondering about whether the this misdiagnosis might be more common for men. Well, patron Erica, you are smart to a- ask these questions because these are relevant questions to ask ourselves. The first thing I'll say is you, you say that I'm not keen on using these labels in therapy. Uh, have I said that? Um, that's doesn't sound like me. I mean, I'm not big on pathologizing or stigmatizing people or, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, as long as the labels aren't used to harm people, I think, and they're, and they're used to conceptualize, which is, and the conceptualization is used to actually improve treatment and research, then I'm all for the labels personally. Uh, but, but the labels have to be considered in light of social constructionism, culture, the history of psychology, your own biases, the, the, the culture of the DSM, you know, as long as you consider all those things, which is a lot, then I think ethical and moral usage of the labels of the DSM are uh, possible. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'm not keen or keen on the labels. Uh, you also asked Patron Erica, uh, the risks of misdiagnosing borderline personality with with bipolar. Well, the most obvious risk is if you, you know, someone comes into your office and they're borderline and you misdiagnose them as bipolar, then the risk is you're going to prescribe them medication for bipolar, which is not going to help them with their borderline. And there are side effects to those medication. On, and in the reverse, if you misdiagnose someone with uh, who actually has bipolar in a biological sense, and you misdiagnose them with borderline, then you're going to not give them medication that they need, and they might become super manic or super depressed, and then, and then we're in trouble. So yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, risks uh, in terms of that. But in terms of, um, and I, I, I suppose also the treatment modality could get screwed up as well, in that borderline requires a very specialized interpersonal treatment regimen, whereas bipolar, the, there, there isn't really a psychotherapy for bipolar in that you can help people cope with their condition, but you're not going to take it away with psychotherapy. Whereas with borderline, you absolutely can take it away with psychotherapy. It takes a long time, but you can do it. And so, um, So there's, there's, there's a Venn diagram, definitely, you know, like if you're helping them with emotional regulation and support and normalizing their feelings, then that'll help with both. So the psychotherapy risks are maybe a little less than the medication risks, but you know, both are prone to acting out, both are prone to suicidal behavior. And so if you misdiagnose, then it's probably not going to be that big of a deal in those areas. The reason why people often conflate the two, which is bizarre to me because they're so different, but I, I think the reason why people make a mistake about it is because there's this notion in my field that when someone is erratic and upset and highly activated and suicidal in a very chaotic way, then they're automatically given the label of bipolar. It's really just bizarre because bipolar is a complicated disorder and you really need to understand the history of the course of their moods. You have to, you have to really nail down that they actually become manic, by the way. I mean, there are versions of bipolar that people aren't quintessentially manic or uh, so there's that, but, but anyway, unless unless you really assess someone well, you can't diagnose them with either one of these disorders, particularly borderline. Borderline takes 
weeks to really fully understand whether or not someone can qualify for the diagnosis. But with bipolar, it's not as long, but at the very least, you need a, a, you know, you could probably assess someone in one, you know, one hour if you really put your mind to it, maybe a couple hours. Um, but what I see a lot of people doing is they will assess someone for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, and they'll base their entire impression of that patient based on the way they're presenting at that moment. So in my experience, what happens is someone with borderline who has relational traumas, which causes their borderline, they are triggered by some relational uh, rejection, like being divorced or being cheated on or being fired at work. And they their relational PTSD becomes highly symptomatic and they become very upset, demoralized, suicidal, rageful, uh, acting out, chaotic, um, drinking a lot of alcohol maybe, they just become very unhinged naturally because their traumas are triggered. And then that's when they end up becoming hospitalized or they come into contact with a medical professional or you know someone who doesn't know this person very well. And then the assessor just looks at them and goes, oh, you're bipolar. And I, I just find that to just be incredibly short-sighted. <laughs> And it's happened to my my own clients. I've had I've had clients of my own who have had that happen to them, where I've been seeing them for years and totally understand their symptoms and have completely verified over and over again that it's that it's borderline and has nothing to do with a mood disorder. And then they'll become symptomatic. They'll end up in a hospital, and the psychiatrist will diagnose them with bipolar and give them lithium. And I'm and I'm like. At what point were you going to call the primary clinician, me, for consultation regarding whether or not this person has bipolar? It's it's bizarre. So, uh, yeah, I see that a lot. Um, I don't see so much the reverse. I don't see a lot of people with bipolar being diagnosed with borderline. Uh, bipolar is one of those trendy diagnoses of today, like ADHD. It's just very trendy to see bipolar everywhere. And uh, I think that's a problem. Um, also, Patron Erica, you, you ask, I was also wondering about whether this misdiagnosis might be more common among men. Yes, absolutely. Because when men are, so one, borderline is associated with women, even though uh, uh, according to studies of the people who have borderline, a third of them are men. But I would say that, even that those studies underestimate the amount of men who have who have borderline because the thing about borderline is it's a result of being relationally traumatized meaning that your parents abandon you or you or you just have some sort of massive attachment disruption early in life and men and women are just as prone to that but the the way we associate behaviors of men and women and the, and the behaviors that we encourage in men, as opposed to, beha- the, to the behaviors we encourage in women, present themselves in such a way that makes men not look borderline when in fact they are borderline. So a lot of men who have relational traumas and I would diagnose them with borderline are, in my uh, opinion, are misdiagnosed as either bipolar because they're, because men are, you know, men are socialized to externalize and to be angry. And so Men who become, uh, you know, triggered on their relational trauma will become really activated, almost hyperactive, aggressive, hostile, uh, even domestically violent, which I, I've seen a lot. There's a lot of borderline men who, because they're so desperate for security and and um, and not being abandoned, they'll paradoxically. Um, really alienate their spouse and try to control them to keep them nearby. Not because they like to be a dick, but because they are terrified of losing someone in the way that they lost someone when they were young. And so men who end up being assessed uh, quickly by someone who is diagnosing them, they won't see borderline. They'll see bipolar, they'll see antisocial, they'll see narcissistic. But the key element that needs to be investigated that that differentiates borderline from all these other things is that 
it all has to do with relational trauma and that's the trigger. So once you understand that someone's symptoms are all uh, preceded by a relational trauma that felt like abandonment to the person, then you understand, oh, this is borderline. It's not narcissism, which is you know a different kind of injury on the self. It's not bipolar because bipolar isn't triggered by that kind of thing. I mean, you can have mood disorder symptoms that are exacerbated by stress, but but not like not that it doesn't look like this. I mean, I, I have peop, clients, I know people personally and professionally who have borderline or, or at least, and when I mean borderline, I don't necessarily mean the full blown disorder. I just mean the, the spectrum of borderline personality. People with this personality, when they, when they become rejected, they, they react strong and hard <laughs> and you see it because their, their PTSD is completely just smashed against their brain and they don't have any other choice. And it's just so obvious that what their primary issue is, is their PTSD regarding attachment injury. So, so when men have that triggered, they become very aggressive and hostile. And that's the, you know, apparently the trademark of bipolar to many stupid diagnosticians. (laughs) So, so absolutely Paige and Erica, there, there is um, a lot of misdiagnosing of men. And it's taken me a while, actually, to recognize borderline in men. In, in the beginning of my career, I uh, very early on was exposed to a number of clients with borderline, and they were all women. And I became extremely familiar with borderline in my early career. And, and now I, I feel very comfortable treating people with borderline. But as time went on, I found myself just wondering, am I ever going to come across a, a male with borderline? And, and slowly I started realizing, oh, I have been coming across men with borderline. I just didn't know what they looked like. And now that I know what they looked like, uh, I, I know how to treat them. Now, also, I should say that some people actually have both. Some people have borderline and bipolar. And it's actually not that hard to figure that out, actually. Because, again, bipolar is just so different than borderline. It complicates the diagnostic process for sure. But, you know, if you spend enough time with someone, you'll figure that out. All right, let's read another email. What do you say? All right, this email is from an anonymous patron uh, a year ago. This patron (laughs) wrote in. I'm sorry. I'm just getting to this email. That's part of the reason why I'm doing this episode in which I'm just sort of trying to power through a bunch of emails is because I have this huge backlog of all these emails. Okay. It's from an anonymous patron. Hello, Dr. Honda. For a while... For a long while, I thought I had anxiety, but in reality, I think I actually had ADHD. Let me explain. In the past, my anxiety was getting worse and worse. I felt like I was being chased by a cheetah all day long. When I got home from work, I would drink a bottle of wine just to calm down. I hated this routine, and I knew it was not healthy and could lead to worse things. So I decided to see a psychiatrist. She asked me if I had ever been diagnosed with ADHD. At this point, ADHD was not even on my radar. She said, I think you are struggling with ADHD, and I think you should consider getting on a stimulant. My initial thought was, this woman is crazy. Everything I have ever heard about stimulant medications has been in a negative light, and I just was not sure about trying them. But at the same time, my anxiety was so bad, I needed to do something. So I took the leap, and for and the first day I took it was on a Friday. I took it and went to work, and I can't even explain how incredible I felt. It was as if I went from 15 screens in my mind to one screen. All the shiny things that were always trying to compete for my attention had gone away. The cheetah that had been chasing me was gone. My parenting also improved. And my anxiety decreased because I could concentrate better and could depend on my brain to work well in stressful situations. I have become a better person, a better mother, and a better wife. I can't imagine where I might be today if I had let the views of society hold me back and not taken the leap to try the stimulant medication. And some people might call me crazy for being on these medications because I have a heart that goes into atrial fibrillation and the stimulant could increase my symptoms. But the medication took away the anxiety and stress, and as a result, I went from going into atrial fib several times a week to hardly ever. End of email. Well, 
anonymous patron. I think you said it all there. I hope the listeners benefit from all this stuff. Yeah. ADHD can absolutely cause anxiety for people. Not at first, but as people develop, they soon learn that they can't depend on their brain and that they get in trouble a lot or they drop the ball a lot and they, you know, people are suddenly screaming at them or, or suddenly they realize, oh my God, I forgot to pick up my kids at school. Or, and so there's this kind of re, there's this kind of ongoing traumatization that happens to someone with ADHD that can cause anxiety. But the, but the real, and the anxiety is real, but the, but the core, the foundation, the, the root of the problem is someone's ADHD. Essentially with ADHD, your executive system in your brain, your prefrontal cortex, as the theory goes, and there's a lot of evidence pointing in this direction, is for whatever reason just not properly working in, in concert with the rest of your brain. And so although a lot of your brain is, is working uh, well, it's, it, the, the neurons firing to your, your executive system are just not as robust. And so when you give yourself a stimulant, it, it jacks up all of your connections in all neurons. That's why when you're on coffee and caffeine, you, you just find yourself having much more energy because you're, uh, I could go into the boring um, physiology of this, but essentially it just makes your neurons much more likely to fire. And therefore your executive system in your brain is better able to work in concert with the rest of your brain. And so that's why stimulants work for ADHD people. And it's just strange to me how much there's how much stigma there is around uh, ADHD meds. I mean, it's just caffeine uh, in a pill. It's just it's the it's a very similar action on the brain. And no one's afraid of coffee, right? So why would you be afraid of Ritalin? I think it's because it was prescribed over prescribed to people for for years and years, you know, you had a kid who, for whatever reason, was struggling in school, and they were misdiagnosed with ADHD, and they were given Ritalin, and then the kid took it for five years, and then had stunted growth and maybe other kinds of long-term symptoms. You have stunted growth because stimulants are an appetite suppressant, so the kids don't eat enough. And so, um, the, uh, so you have these these reports that come out and then everyone's like, Oh my God, Ritalin is evil. I mean, if you just walked up to the random, random person on the street and said, what do you think about Ritalin? My guess is, is they would just say, Oh, it's an evil drug that should never, you know, should never be given to kids or something like that. And it's just such a simplistic viewpoint regarding stimulants among medications that psychotropics that are available to us, like psych, uh, stimulants like Ritalin and, and Adderall are extremely safe. They, you can take them once. You can take them for one day and then say, did it work or not? Whereas with Prozac, you got to take it for like a month or longer before you even know if it's working. And by then it's like fully ingrained in your biology. And in order to get off of Ritalin or uh, Prozac, you, you know, you have to sort of wean yourself off of it. And then it slowly is expelled from the body because it's, it's a, it's building up a certain, uh, you know, lo ongoing load in your, in your body. Whereas with stimulants, it, you know, the half-life is pretty short. And so, you know, pretty quickly it can be expelled from your system. So if it, if it gives you bad side effects, you know, you just stop taking it. So all that is just very strange. Having said that it has been overly prescribed and ADHD is absolutely over there. Are people with ADHD, as with a lot of diagnoses, <laughs> ADHD is both underdiagnosed and overdiagnosed. There are so many people like this anonymous patron who has probably been suffering from ADHD their entire life, but has never even been, no one has ever even suggested it to her before, which is just a failing of my field, by the way, and of our society. And then you have many kids who are just being normal kids and are 
quickly labeled as ADHD, or they have stress at home or self-esteem problems or anxiety or depression or something, and then they're just labeled as ADHD, even though there's so many other possibilities as to what it could be. So, I mean, when was the last time you heard a teacher say, that kid is anxious, we need to put that kid on an anti-anxiety medication? I mean, I've never heard a teacher say that. I'm sure some of them do, but I've never heard it. Whereas how many times have you heard a teacher say, that kid is bothering me, we need to put that kid on Ritalin, that kid has ADHD. Well, that happens all the time. Well, the prevalence of anxiety is higher than the prevalence of ADHD in children. Just think about that for a second. Anxiety for kids and teens, it's you're about two and a half times as likely to experience a kid with anxiety with an anxiety disorder than you are to experience a kid with ADHD. The prevalence rates are hard to nail down because it's just hard to study that kind of thing. But this is for the United States, by the way, it, which ADHD is quote unquote, much more prevalent because it's much more uh, diagnosed in the United States, but you're much more likely as a kid to suffer from anxiety than you are from ADHD. Yet how many times are people, talking or how quickly are people to identify people as ADHD as opposed to anxiety. And of course, if you're anxious, then you're going to have trouble concentrating. You're going to be distracted. You might act out. You, you might, you know, have trouble in school. And so, you know, and that's a problem. Now I'm not saying that kids should go on any anxiety medication. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, that we have to become much better at identifying anxiety in kids and treating anxiety in kids. It's hard with kids. It's, it's hard to do any kind of therapy with kids because they almost never are voluntarily coming to therapy. And they almost never have the emotional awareness that a healthy adult has. And so they have a hard time talking about their feelings and and they also might not even be receptive to your help regarding it. Whereas adults who are suffering from anxiety often really want help and are willing to go to therapy to get that help. So it's hard, but, but at the very least, we should stop misdiagnosing anxiety uh, as ADHD. But anyway, so this patron brings up a, a, just a very interesting you know, experience in which she had thought she been experiencing anxiety her whole life and that that was the problem. And then she goes on a, you know, an ADHD medication for one day and everything snaps into place and she suddenly realized, oh, I have ADHD. And that's the nice thing about ADHD is that often, not always, but often if you have a, if you have a legit brain disorder called ADHD, because it's a, it's a disorder of the brain, if you have a legit brain disorder of ADHD and you take a, a prescribed stimulant, you will very quickly realize whether you'll very quickly learn that you have ADHD. Whereas if you give a stimulant to someone else, someone who doesn't have ADHD, in general, they don't benefit nearly as much. But um, anyone on stimulants will become, they'll, they'll, they'll have better focus and they'll get more things done. You know, it's like being manic, right? You've all heard of people being on meth and they stay up all night and like clean their house or something. Well, that's an extreme because meth, you know, it's the same, it's a stimulant. It's the same action essentially as caffeine or Ritalin or Adderall. And so even if someone doesn't have a brain disorder of ADHD, then, and you give them a stimulant, then in all likelihood that'll improve things a little bit. But what you hear from people that have legit ADHD is like what this patron is saying. You know, she's saying, I, I took it and went to work and I can't even explain how incredible I felt. It was as if I went from 15 screens going on in my mind to just one screen. All the shiny things that were always trying to compete for my attention had gone away. And then she goes on to talk about how she has a heart condition that makes it that, and she had, and she goes into atrial fib several times a week. And she's like, should I go on the, the stimulant medication? Because I could, I could potentially die because of my heart condition. Well, guess what? She takes the stimulant and because the stimulant actually helps her to concentrate, which 
drastically reduces her anxiety, if not eliminates it. And that takes away the stress, which takes away the precursors of her atrial fib. So isn't that interesting, <laughs> right? And uh, this, this little pill uh, called a stimulant can solve all those problems. You know, it's, it's amazing what can be done with proper psychiatric care and proper psychiatric ass assessment. This psychiatrist was so smart to, to say, uh, there's a chance you have ADHD, actually, even though the client was presenting as anxious. So congratulations, anonymous patron. Let me know how you're doing. This was a year ago. They emailed me. <laughs> so let me know. Um, a different anonymous patron wrote in about ADHD as well. So I thought I would talk about that. I listened to your adult ADHD episode. How can you tell the difference between anxiety and ADHD? I have thought for a couple years now that I have ADHD, but whenever I bring it up with a doctor or therapist, they either don't feel qualified to make the, that diagnosis or they said it's anxiety and not ADHD. But no matter how good my meds work, I always have the, the same few symptoms that seem like ADHD to me. I know my meds work because my depression is much reduced. For instance, I watch very few, mo very few movies even the most common ones you can think of because I cannot sit still during them. So this patron is giving examples of ADHD symptoms. So this patron says they don't watch movies because they can't sit through the entire movie. I'm always the person that people are flabbergasted at. They'll say, you haven't, you haven't seen Titanic the movie? The worst was in school when I would have to watch some boring history movie and write about it as I knew it was a lost cause. And I was a great straight A student. Same with books. I have a ton of books to read, but I just can't focus. I will read, reread, reread, etc., and then give up because I can't focus. I have a hard time being on time to things, and I am that person you described that's, that starts a task then ends up not finishing it after going down a million rabbit holes. My computer is the worst for this, as I end up with 10 tabs open and nothing accomplished. It is very hard for me not to interrupt someone. I often cannot stop myself from blurting out crap that I think is just so good to, to say. How can someone even tell if it's ADHD or anxiety? Well, anonymous patron, According to what you're saying, it sounds very much like ADHD and not anxiety. That urge to interrupt someone is just classic ADHD. People who, because essentially what's happening is you're in a conversation and your brain is listening, right? You're, you're paying attention to what they're saying. And then they say something to you, which triggers you to think about something else. And then your brain, your executive system, because it's not, it's not as well connected to the rest of your brain, and you know it's a blunt metaphor, but go with me on that. Your 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 prefrontal cortex is not uh, connected well enough to sort of corral your attention, and so you start paying attention to an internal thought, and then something occurs to you, and then you just you just blurt it out. Meanwhile you have interrupted someone. But if you have a stimulant and your prefrontal cortex is able to connect better with the rest of your brain, or you take another person who doesn't have ADHD and their prefrontal cortex is actually connected uh, you know, normally to the rest of their brain, then when you're listening to someone and it triggers a thought in your head, you have the power in your brain to and the, the decision making process that's very quick that says, well, don't blurt out something that, you know, continue listening to this person because it's impolite and it and it, it's gonna hurt their feelings if I just interrupt them. So yeah, that's classic ADHD is is interrupting. And it's one of the hallmarks. <laughs> if you have a spouse or someone in your life who frequently interrupts, uh, this is a, this is something to look at in terms of, uh, you know, a possible solution. Now, I will say that there are many other solutions besides medications to ADHD. 
there are ways in theory in which you can actually increase the connection to the executive system uh, in that you can do activities that require concentration. And, and the hypothesis goes that that's, that'll generalize to outside of that exercise. But you can also help people with coping mechanisms. Like if you, um, you know, if someone says, I have ADHD, but I don't want to take meds, or I have ADHD, but my meds don't really work. Well, in therapy and in coaching, you can actually learn techniques of, of, of not uh, letting your ADHD get in the way. Like with interrupting someone, you can practice with a coach listening and avoiding your distractions and making sure. So there's, there's, it's kind of a mindfulness technique in a sense. It's just paying attention to how your brain is working and just really making sure that you pay attention. Now, this actually will be quite fatiguing to someone with ADHD. If they're not using meds and they're just sort of exerting control to try to wrangle in their brain, this can actually be very tiresome to the brain. The brain can become fatigued just like a muscle can. That's why at late at night, your brain isn't just working quite right because it's been working hard all day. And so you... Uh, if you have ADHD and you use this form of coping where you're just trying to exert control over your brain and you're, you know, through reminders, maybe you have like little notes to yourself of like, pay attention, listen, don't interrupt and that kind of stuff. Well, your brain's going to become real tired and then you're, it's going to be really hard to do anything, let alone exert control over your uh, distractibility and hyperactivity. And so, so in that way, coaching comes in and says, well, how do you know when you're depleted? And how do you tell people you're depleted? Maybe you tell your spouse, look, I can't, my brain is not working right right now. I'm sorry. I, I can't really listen to you right now because my ADHD is really kicking in. Or, oh, I just interrupted you. I'm really sorry. My ADHD kind of kicked in. Will you please start over from the beginning of what you just said? You know, there's, there's all these different ways that you can work relationally with other people. And also you can bring these other people into therapy and coaching around ADHD to learn how to interpret ADHD behaviors. For instance, not taking it personally when someone with ADHD interrupts you, but also just how to help someone with ADHD with their symptoms. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. So the three different non-medication things that you can do is, again, to review, trying to, uh, in theory, build up the neurons and the connections between the executive system and the rest of the brain by doing exercises that require a lot of particular kinds of attention. And then the second thing to do is to help the individual cope better by having kind of workarounds and concentration skills and awareness skills and just, you know, various different skills to help them to work around their ADHD uh, symptoms and account for their own limitations. And then the third thing you can do is talk with everyone around the ADHD person so that they can uh, understand and not take it personally. And also they can do things to help the person uh, with their ADHD. So, so there's a lot you can do, but anyway, so the second anonymous patron, yeah, like from what you're saying, you, you know, you have a hard time. Uh, you can't sit through a movie. That's not an anxiety symptom. I mean, if anything, movies can actually be very easy for someone with anxiety because it's this, um, I don't know, you're, you're sort of safe in this cocoon and you can watch this movie. So uh, it, unless you have a phobia against movies or something. But, but anyway, yeah, sitting through an entire movie, that's hard for someone with ADHD because five minutes into the movie, the ADHD person is like, okay, I'm ready for something else now. <laughs> you know, this is boring. Um, also, you remember in school that you couldn't sit through a history movie and write about it. Whereas other kids who don't have ADHD, they don't have a problem with that. They can sit through a history movie, you know, they might be bored, but they're not, it's not going to be a lost cause like the way you said it was going to be. Also, the inability to concentrate on a book. That's a sign of ADHD. It's also a sign of anxiety, by the way, 
because if you're super anxious, then it's really hard to concentrate. So, you know, it's not as much of a slam dunk. Um, also, you say that when, um, y- that you, you're like the person I described in the episode in which I talk about adult ADHD, in which you start a task and then you end up realizing, oh, wait, I started a, I started this process and I didn't finish it. I got to go back to it. You know, like, you know, I don't know, like cleaning the kitchen or something, which requires like a hundred different steps. And you wipe off the counter and then you look outside and it's raining and you're like, oh, I wonder if my bike is outside. And then you walk outside and you're like, oh, my bike isn't outside. Oh, I wonder what my neighbor's doing. And then you go to the neighbors and then, you know, go down all these different rabbit holes and you come back to the house and you say, Oh yeah, I, I started washing. I started cleaning the kitchen and I got one step into a hundred steps and somehow I was at the neighbors playing, playing ping pong when I started the day set on cleaning this kitchen. That's so strange that my brain did that. That's, you know, hallmark ADHD. So um, now it sounds like, your clinicians aren't going along with you. That could mean a number of things. That could mean that you don't understand your symptoms very well and uh, your clinicians understand you better. I have a hard time believing that. <laughs> I, I, I suspect that you understand yourself better than, than your clinicians do. And based on what you're saying at the beginning of this email, I would recommend you just find another clinician, that you find an expert in ADHD. Uh, ADHD, you would think, is one of those common disorders that people understand, but people don't. Uh, it's it's a complicated thing. Things like depression are so easy to understand that clinicians, most clinicians, and even many primary care physicians totally understand depression. It's not hard to get. But ADHD is is really complicated, actually, and you have to have a fair amount of, of experience with it. Plus, it it's... it's ADHD can actually be enough. It's possible that once we understand the brain better, we might actually find that what we today call ADHD is actually like 10 different disorders that we're kind of wrapping into one because there's actually a lot of different presentations of ADHD. And part of that might have to do with that we're lumping 10 different disorders into one, but it also might also have to do with the fact that ADHD can affect your personality, which can affect the way your personality develops, if that makes any sense. But anyway, anonymous patron, I recommend, you know, talking to a specialist, which I think I told you in an email back to you. And good luck with that. And let let us know how that goes. All right, let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll talk about more patron emails. What do you say? All right, we're back back, 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 talking about patron emails. If you haven't already become a patron in which your emails get uh, answered more thoroughly, become a patron. Also, when you become a patron, you get access to all of our premium episodes, some of which are several hours long. (laughs) So become a patron now. Do it. Go to patreon.com. That's patreon.com. Become a patron. Do it now. All right. This email is from patron Danny. Patron Danny says, please talk about how a client should terminate, how a client should terminate, and when to know it's time to terminate. How much change should one expect after termination? What what issues will come up? Do clients go back for check-ins? How does that check-in relationship last? How long does that check-in relationship last? I wonder about the parameters of self-sufficiency versus dependence on the therapist. Okay. Interesting question. Very complicated answer. (laughs) So you want to know how a client should terminate, patron Danny. Well, that's a tough one because there are so many different kinds of therapeutic relationships, so many different kinds of therapies. You know, you could see a therapist for five sessions or you could see a therapist for 20 years. And those are naturally going to be extremely different termination um, experiences. The, the general advice, I would say, is do what you want. Do what impulse you have. If you have an impulse to just say goodbye and walk out the door and say see ya, 
and make a joke and that's it, then do that. If you have an impulse deep inside that you want to have a very meaningful kind of kumbaya moment, um, which is the kind of moments I like to have with my clients, then then ask for that. If you want to have a termination that lasts, that you know you you go you talk about it for ten sessions about termination, because that's what feels right to you, then do that. Or if you just want to email your therapist and say, yeah, I think I'm done, you know, do that. And I've seen it all from clients, believe me. Clients terminate with me in so many different ways. So so think about what you want and what you feel like you would best benefit from. So, you know, do what you want. Also, you ask, when do you know it's time to terminate? Well, that is an impossible question to answer. Clients sometimes ask me this, and what I tell them is, you'll know when you're done (laughs) or you'll know when you need a break or you'll know when you're ready for a break. Because the other thing is termination for many clients in my practice and other people in private practice, terminate, no one ever really terminates. They, they take a break. Now the break could be 10 years, but it's usually a break or at least when you terminate it, it's framed as a break because you know, they're welcome to come back. And so, so what I say is, to people, they say, so when do, when will I know that th- my therapy w- with you is over? And I say, well, you'll know because you'll, you'll have an urge to take a break or you won't really be looking forward to therapy anymore or you'll come to therapy and you won't have anything to talk about. Um, in, in the strictest sense, you, you're supposed to terminate when your goals have been met. So you're supposed to have these discrete goals of therapy. But a lot of clients that I see in my practice don't have discrete goals. They want to explore. Th- I mean, the, their goals are things like explore their life, explore their options, talk about, get support, um, think about how their family of origin issues affect them. And the demarcation line between having succeeded in their goal is extremely hard to define. So, but technically speaking, um, termination happens when your goals have been met. So, um, so you're asking me when will you know it's time to terminate? And I say, when you don't feel like doing it anymore, (laughs) when you feel like it's, it's, um, no longer necessary. And I'll get more into the dependency thing because you asked that later. You ask, how much change should one expect after termination? Um, again, depends. I would say, uh, you know, I, that's a hard question to answer too. I guess it really just depends. Another question you ask is, what issues will come up? Well, again, depends on the relationship. But my guess is, is patron Danny, you're asking these questions because you might feel quite attached to your therapist. Well, if, when you terminate with your therapist, you're going to miss that person. And you're going to think about that person. You're going to think about your therapist. And, you know, and there's going to be some grief. And there's going to be some loss. And that could be very minimal or it could be very extensive. It, it just depends on, um, on what happens for you. Also, you asked, do clients go back for check-ins? Absolutely. Uh, it depends on the therapist, but I would say most therapists are totally cool with you making an appointment for check-ins. A lot of my clients, particularly my couples, my ongoing couples, they only come in like once a month. And we're, we're basically in the check-in period for years because that's what is working best for them. Because you know, they, they came to therapy for a while and went weekly, and then they went every other week. And they worked hard for a period of time, and their relationship is, is going mostly well, but they, they need monthly tune-ups. And so, um, so f- for some clients, it's a, it's a regular part of the treatment to have regular check-ins. So if you want to go back for a check-in, um, it, again, depending on the therapist and depending on their schedule, um, you know, it's customary to do check-ins. It's fine. Um, you don't even have to necessarily call them check-ins. You could just call it like, I want a session every now and then. <laughs> so there's that. You ask, how long does that check-in relationship last? Well, I think I already answered that one because I was saying that um, 
it's possible to have a check-in relationship for the rest of one's career. <laughs> um, so like I suspect there are some clients I'm seeing right now. Uh, I suspect I'll be, there's a few of them that I'll be seeing for decades into the future. And that's fine, you know? So, uh, and to me, that's the optimal way to approach therapy is once you find a good therapist, you, you work for maybe a couple years, maybe six months, and you feel ready to take a break, you take a break. And then you're feeling stressed out or you're just feeling like, ah, a lot of issues kind of built up in my soul. I need to talk about it with someone. You go back into therapy for another month. Then you, you feel ready to take a break. You take another break. A year later, something bad happens. You go to therapy for a year and then you take a break. And so that's to me the, cause that's what I do as a, when I go to my therapist, it's like that, you know, I, I take breaks and then I go back. And so, um, you know, you, that, that check-in quote unquote relationship can last forever. I think clients sometimes have this notion in their head that like you start therapy and then you terminate therapy and that's it. And you never go back. But that's, that's not my experience. Most therapists are totally expectant that things will, uh, that, that old clients will return. You know, it's fine. You also ask here the final question. I wonder about the parameters of self-sufficiency versus dependence on the therapist. So this is a common question. It's, you know, am I becoming too dependent on my therapist? Well, that's something definitely to explore with your therapist. And I bet you your therapist is thinking about that and monitoring it. It's a, it's a myth that a client, that, that clients often become too dependent on therapy. It's this myth that clients become addicted to therapy or something. If you find yourself in therapy and you find yourself thinking, I don't think I'm doing anything anymore. I think I'm just coming here because I'm dependent on this therapist. I, I don't feel like we're doing anything. Well, by all means, bring that up and just just say that. I feel you know I feel like I'm dependent on you and I, I can't break free. That there if if they're a good therapist, then they'll explore that with you, and they might even recommend you take a break for a while. You know, they might say, well, I, I, what I hear you saying is, you don't really want to be in therapy anymore, but you're but you feel like you can't live without me or something. And I'm here to tell you that you know you can take a break, and if you want to come back, you can. Um, so don't worry that you're going to lose me entirely if you take a break. Um, so, you know, you, you can have a conversation around that. The other thing I'll say is there are some instances, many instances that I've experienced as a therapist in which a client keeps coming back to therapy. So just hypothetically, and this is sort of, this happens to me sometimes, I'll have a client who has been, been coming for a while and they come in, they sit down on my couch and they say, I don't really have anything to say. I don't even know why I'm here. And so in one way you could look at that and say like, well, why didn't you just cancel? <laughs> because if you didn't have anything to talk about, then, then why are you here? But I don't think that because the way that I see people in this situation is such that there's a part of them that has bonded with me and they are benefiting from that as a corrective experience that they didn't get from their parents. If, you know, t as an analogy, if say you wanted to, you, you made lunch with your mom or something, you're like, you're like, oh, mom, let's go to lunch next week or something. And, you know, and, and you meet up with your mom for lunch. Well, you might sit down and, and not have an agenda to talk about, right? You just want to experience your mom, right? You want to be with your mom. You want to, you want to, um, interact with with someone who's important to you because it just feels good. You'll walk away from that lunch feeling better, even though you didn't have an agenda going in and you didn't have anything. You didn't have a bullet point th list of things you wanted to get to with your mom. You just wanted to be with your mom because that that's healing. It feels good. It provides security for us. Human contact provides that for us. Well, going to your therapist for that um, is along those lines too. Now, ultimately and optimally, you would have people like this in your real life that provided you with that sort of satisfaction. But many people don't have that for a lot of different reasons. 
often because of their family of origin experiences makes it hard for them to cultivate those kinds of relationships. And so their therapist might be that one person that they can really depend on. And there is nothing wrong with using therapy in that way. Their humanistic therapy, psychodynamic interpersonal therapies, that's, that's bread and butter. The relationship heals and the relationship provides stability and the relationship helps people to go on with their life. And so some people would look at that and say, oh, you're overly dependent on your therapist. But I completely disagree with that. In fact, I might agree with that and say, well, so what? <laughs> um, you know, if, if husband and wife are dependent on each other for security, for love, for attention, for, you know, having fun together, you wouldn't say, what's wrong with you? Why are you dependent on your spouse in that way? We're all dependent on our loved ones. We, we depend on other people to be there for us when we're sad and to be there for us when we want to have fun in life. Well, a therapist being there for you is just another person that is being there for you. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and that dependence, uh, so to speak, is, is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. And our American ideal of being completely independent and, you know, individuated is a complete myth based on patriarchy, based on Northwestern Europe notions. And it's actually highly destructive to your psyche to, to enact that kind of lifestyle. It deprives you of the dependence that you deserve to have. Everyone deserves to be dependent on someone and to be taken care of. Everyone deserves to have people in their life that they can depend on, that they will turn to when they're upset and when they have needs. And this idea that I can do it alone is just terrible. It's just unhealthy, unrealistic, inhuman, and destructive. And so if you're dependent on your therapist somewhat, you know, so what? Let it happen. <laughs> it's probably helping you. All right, let's uh, read another email. What do you say? All right, this last email is from Patron Nathan. Patron Nathan writes and says, So I listened to your last podcast about domestic violence. This was a while ago. I listened to your podcast about domestic violence, and I was a bit disappointed that you didn't talk about the way you treat perpetrators. I'm really interested in hearing about how you deal with people that are clearly in the wrong. It seems like a complicated issue. Yes, Patron Nathan, it is an extremely complicated issue. And... I have only participated in the treatment of domestic violence perpetrators or intimate partner violence perpetrators for a short amount of time. So it's not my expertise. So I, I don't know enough about it to do an entire episode. So I'll just answer briefly here. You should really talk to sp specialists in this area because it is a very specialized field. But there was a short amount of time in which I did actually treat uh, DV perps or intimate partner violent perpetrators. These were guys, it was all men, who had been convicted of assault in a court of law and had been court, you know, because they had been uh, domestically violent or, you know, some sort of assaultive behavior toward their wife. And the judge ordered them to go to domestic violence treatment, which is a year-long treatment program, and it's in a group format, and there's individual sessions and group sessions, and it's kind of like uh, chemical dependency treatment, and uh, the model of it is like chemical dependency treatment. Anyway, the, the approach is very difficult to describe, but essentially what I saw is there were there were, very, there were a lot of different kinds of perpetrators. You have perpetrators who come into the group who are extremely remorseful about what they've done. And they are totally dedicated to the therapy right from the start. And they don't defend much. They don't blame their spouse that much. And they utilize the therapy really well. Okay. There's other perpetrators who on the other end of the spectrum, never believe that they are to blame and never take responsibility. And they go through the motions of the treatment and they say the right things eventually and they get out, but they're just going to go out and uh, reoffend in all likelihood. These guys are either psychopaths, antisocial people, 
highly abused people and just lack empathy. They just don't get it. They, they feel, in, or narcissistic people, they feel entitled to ordering around and intimidating their spouse because it feels right to them. And they think that de- you know, domestic violence or intimate partner violence perpetrator treatment is just you know, the feminist agenda trying to beat them down. And so, uh, so there's a lot of different kinds of, of people. And of course, there are women perpetrators. Absolutely, of course. Um, but I've never treated women perpetrators before. So the the treatment involves, um, often involves like skill building, emotional regulation, emotional awareness, mindfulness maybe. Um, you know, the ability to know what you're feeling in a moment can really help a perpetrator understand what's happening for them because a lot of them have been abused themselves and a lot of them have been mistreated and a lot of them have been parented badly and they don't understand their emotions at all they might not even be aware of their body and so you have to do a lot of body awareness with a lot of these guys so so treatment of perpetrators might involve trauma treatment uh and in all likelihood so you have to do a fair amount of assessment and figure out are they a psychopath or not are they traumatized? Are they, do they have PTSD or not? Uh, are, do they have an anger management problem? Is it bipolar? Is it borderline? Is it narcissism? Is it passive aggressive personality? You know, what's going on? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? You know, there, there's, there's just a lot of different roads to becoming a perpetrator in this way. Uh, Did they grow up in a culture in which this was totally normal and they just didn't know any better? You know, there's all these different roads. And so you really have to assess that. Then you, you, so you spend a lot of time emotional regulation, anger management, this kind of stuff. Then you spend a lot of time on breaking down their misogynistic notions. There's a fair amount of time spent confronting them on their deeply embedded notions of sexism and, in t- and male privilege and what relationships look like. Because in all likelihood, their parents were violent with each other. And so that, they'll just look at you and say, well, that's just how couples are. And so the idea that a couple can work out their differences without violence is actually novel to some people. And so, so there's that. You might even do family of origin work with some of these people. Uh, I certainly did with a lot of these with a lot of these guys. Um, now, some of this anti misogyny treatment involves confrontation, and that's where the group comes in. And that's why when you have a group format, you want some people to be close to graduation, and you want some people to be just starting, because the guys who are close to graduation have been essentially indoctrinated into the. <laughs> Uh, and brainwashed into the way that I think, which is that, uh, you know, everyone's equal and that men aren't superior and that you need to treat everyone with respect and you have to check your privilege and blah, blah, blah. And so guys who are almost about to graduate from the group who are, you know, almost a year into the treatment program, they'll, they'll be on board and your group members are your best friends because they'll confront the hell out of their, you know, fellow uh, group members, they, you know, they'll, they have a license to say certain things to each other that I, as a therapist, don't necessarily have a license to say. And I saw some really beautiful things happen in these perpetrator groups. These, um, these more enlightened group members would, uh, confront the, the, the newer guys and you just you would see the newer guys listen much more readily to their fellow group members because they're like, oh, you're one of me, and you're telling me that you know you seem really convinced of of this. Okay, well, I'll I'll think about that. Um, but it takes a long time because you know these misogynistic notions, these cultural notions about gender, are deeply embedded in people, and uh, and are deeply connected with their masculinity and their self identity and their identity and their ideas about love and family and religion. And it, it's a lot of, a lot of entanglement, you know, in there, and there's a, you have to disentangle a lot of these notions. How can you be a good Christian man without necessarily 
being the quote unquote head of the household, you know? How can you be a good Muslim man? How can you be a man without, uh, and at the same time crying in front of your wife? How does a, how does a manly man cry in front of his children? How does a manly man take care of his family and be strong for his family while being vulnerable at the same time? These are very complicated questions that for many men, particularly intimate partner violence perpetrators, they've answered that question time and time again on the wrong side. <laughs> they, they, they answer in the side of what we call destructive masculinity and which results in them uh, really harming other people and, and harming their relationships and harming themselves. And so trying to get them to open up. And I've just seen, the, you know, the thing about perpetrators in general is that they are deeply sad on the inside and they're deeply hurt and they're deeply needy, actually. That's why they reach out and try to control so much is because they need that relationship so badly and they need it to go a certain way. And so they're, they're so desperate for closeness that they will resort to violence to try to preserve their relationship because they're just so scared. And once you get at that gooey center, a lot of emotion comes pouring out. And so that's the general treatment of domestic violence perpetrators. Of course, there are manualized treatment programs. You know, you'll have different worksheets that you'll do in different phases. And, you know, there, there's different things out there. But, but really, the, the best DV perpetrator treatment people that I've seen work flexibly. Um, in my early career, I was like 26 at the time when I was doing this kind of work. And I worked with this a very experienced guy. He ended up actually dying of some kind of lung condition, like while I was working with him. Um, like one day he was just sick and he didn't come in. And then like within like a week he was dead. It was just, it was just horrible. Um, I actually, I remember calling him on the phone. He was in the hospital and, and I was like, I was like, man, you know, I heard it's really serious. How are you doing? And I think he was like in the middle of, some kind of horrible experience. For, and, and he was just like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. See ya. Bye. And he just like, he just like quick, I can't remember what he said, but he just, he, it, he kind of blew me off, you know? And I was, and that was the last conversation I had with him. And I think it was because his lungs were like slowly, like, you know, disintegrating or something. And, and yeah, anyway, so he was great and I worked under him and he was he was just very easygoing but very firm he was very firm with these perpetrators but he had a very kind of masculine hippie vibe to him and he would just get into it with these guys you know he would just he would just stick with it and he was always on his toes and he wasn't afraid of a fight and that's who I used as a model for my treatment of these guys. Um, I would try to emulate that. So that's my approach, Patron Nathan. I'm guessing other people have other approaches, but, but that is my approach. All right. Uh, do we have time? Yeah, we have time. Let's, let's get one more email in here. All right. This email is from Patron Tyler. Patron Tyler writes in. Patron Tyler was on the podcast a while ago. He's the the music therapist, but he says, hi, Kirk, this term, I am enrolled in a research methodology course for my major research paper. And the subject of different types of research came up among them being the replication study. For some reason, I think I remember you discussing issues surrounding the lack of replication studies in psychology in one of your older podcasts. So I thought it would be interesting to pose this to the class and see what kind of conversation would come up. What kind of took me by surprise is the way the professor reacted to the question. There seemed to be this assumption that replication studies were done to, quote unquote, prove people wrong. So let me just chime in here. Yeah, so essentially in psychology and with other areas of research, but particularly in psychology, there's this problem of not having enough replication studies 
when in other sciences, in f- the physical sciences, like with say in medicine, you are tr- you're you're you want to see whether or not a medication is safe in humans and whether or not it's effective in humans. Well, you would never just do one one study and then say, okay, we now know the answer. Let's move on. You you replicate the study several times to see if and and other other research organizations, other researchers will replicate the exact studies that other people are doing to verify whether or not the original findings were accurate. And only after you replicate something and only after you research it from several different angles can a consensus emerge. So you can never just do something based on one study. Whereas in psychology, a lot of times people will do one study and no one does a replication study. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. One is, is that the, uh, the fame you can get from a replication study is almost uh, nil. It is very hard to get any notoriety for a replication study. <laughs> In fact, you can actually get a lot of backlash because say your replication study has very different findings from the original study. Well, the original authors and those who uh, like the findings of the original study will start to blast you, you know? And so there's, there's not a lot of people that become famous because of replication studies where there are, whereas there are people who become famous for original work. So there's that. Plus research is expensive in all fields and there's not a lot of money for it. And so there's this compulsion to research new areas, you know, Plus, when you're doing your dissertation during your doctorate, you're supposed to actually explore gaps in knowledge. You're not supposed to explore how to replicate knowledge. So we, we're all kind of initially socialized to believe that the best research is new research that are exploiting gaps in the research. So now, this isn't say to say we shouldn't have exploratory research and uh, areas uh, we shouldn't explore gaps in the research, but I'm saying that there definitely needs to be a more robust system of replication to verify whether or not some findings are um, are accurate or not. And so I was talking about that, I guess, in a previous episode, and patron Tyler uh, is in class right now, and he brings up this notion of the lack of replication studies. And the um, the assumption from the professor was that replication studies are only done to quote unquote prove people wrong, which in a way is, is kind of true. I mean, if the, if the findings do demonstrate that the original study was uh, in error, then you want to know that, right? I mean, if someone comes out with a claim or a finding and then five other replication studies find a different finding, but, and all five find the same thing and it's different from the original, wouldn't you want to know that? So, yeah, replication is a very good idea. But by implication, what the professor is saying in Tyler's class is that replication studies are somehow hostile to the original um, researcher, which is just not true. Now, if you're insecure about your findings, or you fudged some details, or you had very bad research design, then yeah, you're going to be insecure about someone replicating your study because your study sucks and you know it. And so you're very worried about someone coming along and replicating it because they might actually even ask for your data. And, and so, and, you know, collaboration would say you might share that data. And so if you're insecure about your study, replication will scare you because you're going to get discovered that you suck at research. (laughs) But if your research is, is, is um, sound and you had good design and you had good procedures, you had good controls and your findings uh, were, were based on the data and your, and you didn't speculate too much, then you should actually be quite flattered that someone wants to replicate your study because if someone replicates your, your good study and finds similar results, then then your study is even stronger. The strong studies that we identify in science often have a ton of replication that has verified it. That's that's how it be, that's how it came to prominence is because it has been verified as you know something that was um, uh, consistent across different researchers. Like 
penicillin, for instance. I, I don't know the research course of that, but I suspect that there were replication studies of penicillin, that they didn't just take one person's a study regarding penicillin and say, okay, now let's start giving that out to everyone. No, there's probably been thousands of replication studies and different studies that have looked at penicillin. You know, what if the, the original people, I think it was a, a man and a woman in somewhere who came up with, <laughs> who discovered this mold that got into their Petri dishes and started interfering with their bacteria or something. I don't know. But the point is, is that imagine if those people took offense to replication studies around penicillin. That's ridiculous. You know, it, if your if your findings are sound, then you should be flattered that someone else wants to replicate your study. So going on with patron Tyler's email here, she was also rather quick to admonish the idea of a replication study as a first research paper, even though I didn't say anything about me personally doing a replication study she didn't think it was a good idea to do a bullying paper. <laughs> so again, this, she still considers replication studies to be bullying and hostile. Not that she thought a replication study would be bullying, but that the authors of the study one would try to replicate would see it as bullying. The idea of researchers seeing replication studies as bullying was really weird to me. Yeah, me too. Going on with this email. I can imagine that there might be some kind of threatening feeling associated with replication studies. To me, that really means we should be doing more replication studies, not less. Yeah, Patron Tyler, you're preaching to the choir on this one here. He also says here, I must clarify that this is a research methods course in a music therapy program, not a couple and family therapy program or psychotherapy, because Another point she brought up was that music therapy was too young of a field to be doing replication studies since the theories are so new. So just chiming in here, yeah, uh, I could see that as possibly being a justification for encouraging new research in new areas. But I don't know. If, if someone wants to do a replication study, I say go for it because it's just, it's just not done enough. Also, I think that there's a an issue here potentially in that the the teacher is trying to assign an assignment to the students and, and Tyler is one of those students. And the teacher might just prefer new research in new areas. <laughs> the 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 professor might just, you know, like that to read papers that investigate new areas and, and it just might be a personal preference of hers. And, you know, that's fine. And, and if you want to impose that personal preference on the students, then go for it. But don't act like you don't have a preference, you know? So I think maybe that might be one of the issues too. All right. Uh, Patron Tyler goes on to say, music therapy has been established as a profession for approximately 70 years. So I, th I think he's saying this as a, re as a retort to his professor saying it's too young of a field. So it's been around for 70 years. Um, yeah. So those are my thoughts about that. Patron Tyler often emails me things and I often am, uh, completely agreeing with that guy because, um, he's super smart and, uh, super wise, which is of course why I always agree with him because I'm super smart and I'm super wise. Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Patron Tyler, I might just ask the professor. I think you emailed me this a while ago, <laughs> but uh, it, I, I might have just asked the professor. So, do you just have a preference that I write a, a paper based on new research or something, or that I do a study based on new research? Is that just your thing? Because that's cool if it is. Um, because, uh, but if it isn't your preference, and there isn't any real reason why I can't do a replication study, then I would really like to do a replication study. Oh, another reason why the professor might want you to avoid replication study assignments is because a replication study might mean you get to cut a lot of corners on the assignment because you can just adopt another person's research design. And therefore, you don't have to develop your own research design, which is its own learning process. So maybe the instructor 
is trying to avoid replication for that reason. I don't know. But why not just explicitly say that? You know, the instructor could say, well, I don't want you to do a replication study because I want you to think about your own research design and I want you to sort of start from scratch and go through that whole process. And replication design kind of avoids a lot of those learning opportunities. You know, I don't know. All righty then. That does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself. Let me know what you think of this episode. Um, hey, let's give out some patron swag. Patron swag. All right, how am I going to randomly choose people to send swag to? How about I send people who started with us in 2015? These three people right here have been with us since the very first month that we became uh, that we started on Patreon. We have patron Veronica, patron Jennifer, and patron Elizabeth. Thank you so much, patron Elizabeth and Jennifer and Veronica. I will be sending you some stickers. We have three different kinds of stickers. We have our logo stickers and our uh, a couple other stickers with me and Umberto's faces on it. So you can put that on your backpack and scare everyone with our weird mugs. <laughs> All right. Oh, speaking about mugs, if you want, we, I, I, we have a new mug. And so a new design for a new mug, same type of mud, mug, because it's my favorite kind of coffee mug. It's the perfect handle and the perfect shape, but different pictures on it. And so if you want a mug, you have to become a $20 patron. So do that. And I will go to the post office I, you know, I drive to the post office and I personally mail out these mugs to you because <laughs> I don't have an intern to do that for me. So, all right. Thanks again, patron Elizabeth, patron Jennifer and patron Veronica. You guys are so cool that you became patrons so long ago, all the way back in 2015, back when we had no idea who the next president of the United States was, would be. What a, what a wonderful heady time that was, you know? All right, take care of yourself because you deserve it.